Hey, oh, we're having some technical problems today. I'm not going to lie. Are. I'm not. I'm good. I mean, except for my the countdown was body, like five, three, my one. My spirit. <laughs> my soul. There's lots of stuff going on. Live from a November scented hand soap. It's in the ESG industry's only weekly woke data podcast. Woo! Is that Woo! even true? Nobody knows. Featuring yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it's Analyst Hall, Matt Biscardi. <laughs> Uh, and today's ESG head cold called November 1st, 2023, random ESG awesomeness, director appointment, group think, and a word from the great Paul Hodgson from SK. That sounds like too much. Woo! We have too much stuff. I know. It's going to be like a seven hour show. Strap yourselves in, people, because there's a lot happening and um, there's nowhere to go. Our show today is being sponsored by S Gage, your ESG right. data solutions provider. That's right. Paul will jump on later to talk about ESG metrics in incentive plans. In fact, Paul has a has a call out for our listening audience. Do you want to hear more of this stuff? <laughs> do you want to, <laughs> what more do you want Paul to report on? Do you want to hear more ESG well, metrics and incentive plans? Do you want to have what other? SK has a ton of data. Told ton us of data. They yeah. have a tremendous amount of data about incentive plans. And they want to know if you want to hear more specific things about the incentive plans. Now, frankly, you could just go to SGAGE and buy the data and see all the data instead of listening to Paul. You should and support our sponsors. It, yeah. And then it would be worth it. You can also buy the data, uh, buy different data from freeflowanalytics.com, which is the other sponsor of this show. First, do that first. You think you should do it in the reverse yeah. order? We and should. then you should call the SGAGE CEO and say, uh, why are you listening to Free Float uh, Business Pants every week so much, in fact, that when we miss one sponsor read last week that we got called out for it? Come on. What? We, go. we got... <laughs> <laughs> they got nothing else to do? Tell that CEO to get busy doing other stuff. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm a CEO. I know how this works. You, All right, come you've on. Got you ready for some fun? Do. Ready? All right, we let's do some stuff. stuff. That's terrible music. I hate that. I love it every time. Here we go. Very nerdy. I got very nerdy stories. That's what I do on Wednesday. Very nerdy stories. First one, a tipping point in equal pay. Uh, automakers are scrapping tiered wages. So one of the victories uh, in the the four GM Stellantis, uh, cons- you know, the, the labor, they 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 came to an agreement, right? They just have to. Yeah, they just they, they still just have to pass. Signed the, up, everybody's happy. S- still have to pass the agreement, but I, I can't imagine they won't pass. So uh, Ford GM Stellantis poised to become the latest U.S. corporation to do away with tiered wage arrangements, a system that splits the workforce into haves and have-nots by confining newer employees to lower wages. So uh, since 2001, according to the Washington Post, about uh, around, they're saying around a dozen corporations have, have started to abolish these tiered wages. Earlier this year, UPS uh, narrowly avoided a strike by agreeing to equalize pay. Uh, other companies recently to adopt this, Culligan, Boeing, Harley-Davidson, Ooh. Caterpillar, all because of the urging of workers' unions. So... Uh, this is an issue that I, I hadn't really thought a lot about, but uh, now that I'm now that I am thinking about it right now, uh, it's it's a Just major like win. This second, it's a major win. <laughs> so what you had, Matt, is you had workers at these companies doing the exact same job, making wildly different salaries. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was kills like morale, kills everything. Yeah. Mandatory pay gaps. Yeah, it's crazy. Right? Like, and if you know that women workers doing the same job as the their their male, you know, uh, colleagues get paid eighty cents on the dollar, that means you have a tiered system inside a That's tiered true. system. Well, and, that, and I'm guessing is, a lot of your longer woo! tenured employees would be men in the first place because the diversity hiring pushes are a new thing. Exactly. So yeah. th- there's like a actual th- like if you think about the way the tiering works, this was accidentally or probably accidentally discriminatory. I mean, it was not just against like new employees, but the new employees tend to be more gender diverse and more, you know, racial ethnic diverse. The other thing that this maybe unintentionally discriminates against or maybe intentionally is just the, the notion of unions themselves. Because when these new workers are coming on with these lower pay structures and they can never reach the pay that they're that their tenured employees have, 
a lot of them are probably like, what the f do i care about joining a union anyway it's not helping me like this is all a bunch of bullshit anyway like the unions for the old dude so anyway there you go there's a victory see po- this is good mean, news see well, good we, news are, are, are we officially okay good news um are we officially in the age of the union um like the that's the sentiment going on i mean this is a, 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 a after the union push at ups and this incredible win at, at the automakers it does feel that way Although it feel what it feels like is yeah. is like strategic unionizing. This like was if, this was the most strategic unionizing I think I've ever witnessed. The way I that, mean it, yeah, it, the, it does the way they like rolled it, out different strikes yeah. at different times. Yeah, it w- and it was like targeted at specific plants mm-hmm. with specific Very lines smart. of cars. Very smart. Right, like they it's like a fear they campaign. Basically, yeah, uh, you know what I think? Incredible. I think the union started getting free flow analytics data, and they they <laughs> were reading like proxy statements and, and annual reports and they were like hey this is what they're saying let's hit them exactly where it hurts them the most so that's what i think don't forget one of the big selling points on on these getting these victories was talking about the ceo pay ratios well, that was I one know. of the, the, the the best like sort of emotional ploys used all right moving on here's a here's a headline women on boards directive expected impact on belgian listed companies okay i, I know <laughs> i'm in yeah, deep in. Let's do it. Here's, the, I mean, look, the sidebar here is I'm only picking the story because I want to highlight our data. But who cares? I'm allowed to do that. Yeah. Uh, so here's what's happening it's in Belgium. Sponsor. Since 2011, Belgium had a quota uh, requiring one third of uh, boards to be, basically to be women. Okay. One third of boards. Ba- basically or to be women. <laughs> well, okay. It's the under, it's the underrepresented sex, but obviously that's going to be women, right? Oh, oh, oh yeah. I got you. If, I if got you. If women were in control, it would have applied to men. It would have meant that men have to serve, Look, at least a third have to be men. That's a well-written rule, right? Because you can't yeah. say it's discriminatory. Exactly. It's, that's a well-written rule. Where the rule sucked is that uh, a, a lot of companies in Belgium have a two-tier system, meaning there's a supervisory board and a management board, and there was no quota that applied to the management board. So there you could do whatever oh. you wanted. Yeah, right? It, could be, it didn't matter. It could be 10 men, zero women. So uh, this new quota ha- is aiming to kind of adjust that a little bit. It's it's making it's it's doing better with that, which is all good news. But here's what I really want to point out: is that, uh, and you have covered this several times in the past, but there is a there is a reality going on that that needs to be pointed out repeatedly, which is that despite the fact that in Belgium, thirty nine percent of boards are women, there that's is a good. considerable female power gap because oh, these. Bad. Because 39% of the board represents only 26% of actual influence, according to our data, data that only you can get here, only here. Only, only, that's right. And this is because the average man in Belgium holds 12% of influence, the average woman holds 7%. And it gets even worse if you drill down further, Matt, because uh, 70% of directors with 10% or more influence are men. And that goes up to all Belgian directors who hold it. 20% 20% or more influence, 89% of those directors are men. So the most Ooh. powerful directors at Belgium companies but far and away are men, despite the the well-intentioned quotas that have increased body let, count. Let's pause for like a yeah. nanosecond and say, when we say influence, what we mean mm-hmm. is these are people who are either well-connected to each other, they have been CEOs in the past, or they have like some cachet on their resume. But mostly, what it means is they have chair roles, com, you know, uh, prominent committee roles. They have equity. They're insiders. They were placed there by activists. They are people who have sort of structural power on yep. the board and social power on the board. So we're not like making it Essential. up. It's built on social science. Mm-hmm. And you can see how horrible that kind of is then. Uh, here's another, next door. Another win, maybe. Well, no, it's definitely a win. Uh, a sad win. O'Day, I'll be the judge of that. Yeah. O'Day Asset Management is to close five months after allegations of sexual assault and harassment against its founder, Crispin O'Day. Uh so here's the quote from the company, O'Day Asset Management, including Brook Asset Management and O'Day Wealth will be closing. Fund managers and funds have moved to new asset managers. I mean, this is the first time we've seen the unraveling of a company so quickly after its founder and CEO um, uh, caught up in a, in a terrible uh, sexual assault and harassment scandal. Uh, the crazy thing about this Crispin O'Day jerk 
is that uh, after the first 13 claims came out, he, he of course, denied all of them. But then after oh, right. the 20th woman came forward, he <laughs> then finally broke down <laughs> And uh, admitted uh, admitted the misconduct. So, so that's yeah. the magic number. That's what we just I, need. I if guess we, so. <laughs> yeah. we want to depose, yeah. like white men who have held on to power and are incredibly gropy and heinous, horrible human beings. You just need at least twenty people to step forward. That's um, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. But so goodbye, will he keep goodbye, Chris his? His millions upon millions of, of, of dollars. There's no, right? there's no, no sense of a clawback. Now, Oday Asset Management, I believe, is not publicly traded. This is a hedge fund. No. These are notoriously no. private, and but still, all the more of a victory that a, that a, a such a private enterprise that has probably gotten away with a lot of bullshit over the years has actually managed to dismantle. I, I'm, I don't know. I so credit to the customers. I guess I'm, I'm guessing the customers had a big part of this. They've been pulling out their funds. It's definitely not credit to the 20 plus women that came forward. I mean, that well, credit to them yeah, for coming of course, forward. Of course. But, sure. the, but like him keeping his millions, not so great. No. Next story. Uh, this is this is one good one for us. Um, CEOs should tell more jokes on earnings calls. Stocks tend Ooh. to perform better when they do. Uh, this is from a, re- a paper published in the Review of Accounting Studies. They said when managers use humor on an earnings call, stock market returns uh, are more positive. I, but you know, Matt, they might just also be in a good mood because yeah, the company's well, doing they're well. They're telling jokes because the company's <laughs> but, okay. But here's yeah. the part that got me: you, researchers used machine learning tools to analyze a sample of about twelve thousand earnings calls. So they, so <laughs> we were using, to, they were using machine learning tools to to identify humor. I mean, what? <laughs> I would love, unfortunately, this article, I got to, these are people we got to get on the show because I would love to know how they found a joke in these terrible oh. earnings calls. Well, they probably just looked in the transcript for the word giggle or uh, like, uh, heh, 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 or whatever. The, 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 the crowd erupts with uproarious laughter. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody had to transcribe the, the, the laughter. I, but this is, look. This is a step closer to your lifelong dream. Which is that? Which one is of that? Everyone in a company Free pizza? as mandatory for performance reviews has oh, to yeah, do a five true. minute stand up comedy. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Actually, you think it started it at 20 minutes. It started at 20 and I reduced it to 10. 20 is a really long time. Now, yeah, I, I, I would like to add to it. Uh, I would, I'd rather it be five minute of oh. comedy and then five minute of open mic night. A quiet I'd, reflection. You know, yeah. yeah. No, I want them to get an Play acoustic guitar. guitar and, no, no, no and guitars. S- and sing about Absolutely the falling not. leaves. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, Morgan's, uh, I don't know if you covered the story in my absence. Morgan Stanley's decision to award $20 million special bonuses to the runners up of its CEO succession yeah, party. This is crazy. Oh, yeah, points, yeah, points to a governance risk, of course. So last week, Morgan Stanley announced that the new CEO would be Ted Pick and that it's the two losers. I mean, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I mean, that's kind of, you know, I'm, that's what it, that's I, yeah. <laughs> correct. They lost. Andy they lost. Zaperstein and Dan Sinkovitz, uh, they will stay on, but they are getting a $20 million bonus, which is roughly the equivalent of what they were already earning uh, annually. Um, but here's the kicker, too, is that what, what nobody, of course, reports properly is that the, the, Retiring CEO James Gorman is staying on as executive <laughs> chair. So he's not only is he staying on as a chair, but he's maintaining an executive presence, right? So yeah, what's the point? So this Seriously. is a this is a shit show in the making, no? I mean, you're clearly you're throwing twenty million dollars a piece because clearly one or two of them threatened to leave, I'm guessing, to bounce, right? So you're throwing up some kind of a retention award to keep them around. Also to keep their morale up. Yeah, get the same amount as the other two. All three got the exact same number, I believe. Is is yeah. It remains to be seen what's going to happen eventually to Ted Pick's compensation going forward. But they all got the same bonus to 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 keep doing their jobs to keep to keep making. So you have Gorman, who's owns a ton of shares, has made 
millions upon millions of dollars, moving to the executive chair role where he still basically sits there. Mm -hmm. He was all three of their bosses. He yeah. was the CEO's boss. He's still going to be there. He handpicked the board mm -hmm. and he picks his successor, but it's really a successor in name only because the other three keep doing their job, also got the same amount of money and their old boss is still there every day as we'd an have, executive chair. We'd have to what do an analysis. I, I like an analysis of that announcement uh, internally when James Gorman picked Ted Pick because I, do you think there was a I picked pick joke? Like, do you think there's a little bit of humor? <laughs> we got to get the review of accounting studies to help we, us with that analysis. Oh, I, yeah. we, we definitely need machine learning to figure yeah. out whether anyone laughed. <laughs> but I, I think that's the only reason why he went with Ted Pick just for that joke. <laughs> because because really he's not going anywhere and and there's basically three co CEOs now so you know I mean he couldn't with go with Simkowitz and Saperstein that sounds like a law no, firm anyway terrible, right terrible, like yeah, yeah, you had to yeah. go with Ted Pick yeah uh, how about this uh, I don't know if this is boring or not but this is the, this is the, the day is, we do yeah. boring stories support for S P five hundred say on pay plans increases for the first time in five years according to <sighs> diligent. We got to work more with diligent. They do a lot of pay stuff. We got to get someone on on the show to, to to do something. Or will Paul be mad if we do that? I don't know. No, well, Paul's got all the data. We can get Paul to come on live and we'll drill him. Uh, according to Diligent, uh, uh, C, uh, support for say on pay rose to 89% up from you know, 88, 88%. <laughs> so it's not much of a big deal here. What? Uh, Whoa! But, but they're saying Whoa! that... Oh! <laughs> The reason for this, they are claiming, although there's no actual proof of this, is that CEO uh, average realized pay declined by 68% to $26 million last year uh, compared to $80 million in 2021. But, okay. Yeah. Go but ahead. Wait a minute. Yeah. First of all, those numbers are, are hugely yes, misleading. misleading. Completely. Of course. And, and you know what? Because anytime you report on, on the annual pay of any executive at the companies we talk about, it is misleading. Because really, and and Rick Marshall, who, you know, is still the chair of our board, Rick Marshall yeah, put a lot of great effort actually into showing the career earnings of these executives. Because again, Cherry picking one year of pay does not tell even remotely the story of how much actual money these guys are really getting. And it's not even like these years in particular are incredibly misleading because in 2020, they all took a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. And said mm -hmm. they were giving it up because of COVID and sure. they were magnanimous. A dollar on their salary. Taking, on their salary, yeah. Yeah, on their, just their salary. Meanwhile, their taking salary. stock options mm -hmm. while the market was at an all-time low. Yeah, I was going to say like the best stock COVID. options ever, since 2000. <laughs> 2008, the best ever, and, right? And then the first year, like when a lot of those options vest and like they start actually getting some of the money, they have this massive bump. So it looks like they get a bump. And then the next year, I mean, a lot of the, the CEO trick right now is to give themselves effectively giant a giant pay package with a tier. And when they meet the threshold three years from now, they get like $500 million. Like forget yeah, look, getting $20 look, million a year. Look, there is a very sad reality uh, in these economies that when the 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 when the general economy tanks, the the executives who keep their jobs are gonna make a shit ton of money based just on equity awards. Just on the, alone, yeah, right? just on the equity awards, yeah. and that's when they yeah. pile. You notice, like like if you read all the filings, they don't pile in when markets that are all, at, at all time highs, right? They pile into right. the stock options when their stock is low, and before they announce a buyback. And like any time you know you're gonna get a stock bump, you pile in the option. That's when you do it. Yeah, I wonder how thick the masks were, the COVID masks were for CEOs during COVID because they knew that if they could just survive COVID, they were going to be really extra fun rich, right? They were probably a lot thicker than your average person's masks. That's what, that's my I guess. wonder how many of the CEOs said something like that on an earnings call, got a round of laughter, and then saw the stock yeah. go up and they were happy with their options. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, there was a shareholder vote at Biotechni Corporation. Bi Am I saying that right? Biotechni? I, I, <laughs> I should know this. This is one of the, the, the 500 biggest companies in the, in the U.S. I should know the name of this. Um, I'm should picking you? this story because this is a bit of a preview. We are launching a new show soon. Kind of like the, the what are we calling this? The proxy That's show? That's right. The we are. We're laughing. We're, we're launching a new show. Yeah. 
what's what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going over specifically at every show we're going over uh, votes, uh, meeting votes, and then we're going to be, be previewing upcoming meetings, previewing those votes. So we're going to be helping you decide how to vote and then kind of laughing at how people just voted. Right. That's what we're going to so, do. Yeah. Think of it. Think of it like um, Sports Center. But for annual general meetings and proxies, and yeah, in which, yeah, we'll give you the highlight reel, and then we'll give you our picks for upcoming, you it's, know, uh, games and proxies and all sorts of stuff. It's e e i s s p n. I like that one. All right, here we go. Biotechni, uh, they had a vote. Uh, a couple days ago, uh, here the headline, the big takeaway here: only thirty-five percent of shareholders support Sayon Pay. That's ex- wow. Ex- <laughs> wow! Extreme defeat, Sayon Pay at Biotechni, and they've been struggling in this area the last two years. Only sixty-two percent supported in twenty twenty-two. Only fifty-five percent in twenty twenty-one. Um, usually, you can trace this vote to a very sad stock price, which is happening at Biotechni. It's currently $53 down from a high of $89 in July. But here's the big kicker. CEO Charles Cometh. Oh, tough name. He announced his retirement last year. And uh, uh, and, and according to the proxy statement, uh, the, the compensation committee discussed what to do about this. How we, this, this is true, Matt. I have a quote here. They, they discuss, how are we going to encourage Mr. Cometh to remain and remain motivated through the next two years? <laughs> I mean, really, like, I, like I, I, I mean, you were telling me a story about uh, something that happened at a middle school in your town before we started. Yeah. I mean, this is, is this not like dealing with children? I mean, how this are we going to keep him children. motivated? And, and, First I, of really? all, he's already who, making who? $16 million a year. Is that not motivation enough? <laughs> Apparently not. When did he announce this that he, he was so retiring? He, he's retiring in 2024. He announced this in 2022 uh, in June. And, and let me tell you, Matt. Here's what they did to keep him motivated. Okay, first of all, this is a, just a bizarre story. Okay, so I, I guess the first of all, the 16 million dollars was not enough. So what they did is they announced that they're going to give him a big boatload of options to keep him focused, right? And Oh, yeah. In, no, yeah. In the 2022 proxy they announced to keep him motivated, they're going to give him 200,000 options, which is a lot of options to stay... That's a lot. Fo- ...fixated. But uh, <laughs> according to, to the next year... According to the next year's proxy, and they don't correct this, I don't know if it was a typo or if they intentionally uh, put this wrong, but it's not actually 200,000 options, Matt. It's oh it's one million two hundred thousand options. <laughs> one point two <laughs> million options. So they 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 I don't know if it was like intentionally misleading or not, but re- really what he got was one point two million options to keep his eyelids open. So instead of the toothpicks they could have just put in there to keep them propped oh. like an Atom and Jerry cartoon. <laughs> they went with one point two million with one point two million and this is probably why shareholders are pissed, among other reasons. Yeah. But look, I think there's a lesson that we can take away yeah. here, and maybe we can impart to anybody who's in an executive position. If you announce that you're going to retire two, three, four years from now, uh-huh. everyone will get incredibly worried that you won't do the job that you've been <laughs> doing and it. paid think for. Yeah. So just announce your retirement now and just mm-hmm. like tell your go go into the office right now, bang out the email that says, hey, I, I want to let you know I'm planning on retiring from my position in 2027. And I'm getting very sleepy. I'm getting a little bit and sleepy I just upped, and we're I out of toothpicks. I just renewed my Netflix uh, pa- uh, <laughs> subscription. <laughs> and we're out of toothpicks. Yeah. So I need six to seven million in options in order to keep doing okay. my job. Okay, so here's the and here's the second big takeaway. So th- only thirty five percent of shareholders supported Say on Pay. In fact, they've been pissed at Say on Pay for years. So, well, let's how many look shares at the, does Cometh own? It's probably just Tim. Let's look at the next logical uh, question here: Is how did the shareholders vote against the compensation committee? Right. Oh, they, I mean, yeah. These are the directors responsible for being in chose. Idiots. Yeah, they chose it. They chose it. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, there were th- uh, th- th- the story gets a little deeper here. There were three uh, uh, compensation committee members responsible for this nightmare. That was Joseph Keegan, Randall Randolph Steer, and Rupert Vesey. Uh, Keegan and <laughs> Keegan and Vesey got ninety five percent of the vote. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Re- the former pay chair. 
uh, who's been on the board since 1990 and has has almost as much influence on the board as the CEO, according to our data. He got 82% yes vote. So <laughs> look, uh, uh, credit goes to some cha- some shareholders for realizing that something smelled bad and that was Randolph Steer, right? Um, but here's the crazy part, Matt, is that what they did, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen this. This is like, we talk ad nauseum about all the all the companies that either they, they they screw something up, they apologize, and then they replace the CEO with a woman, right? Yeah, of course, yeah. But this this is the first time I've seen it happen on a compensation committee. So what they did Ooh. is they re, they they made Randolph Steer step down from his role as compensation chair, compensation committee chair. He's still on the committee, of course. I mean, oh, yeah. Well, you he, can't take him off the committee. And he was replaced by a woman, Julie Bushman. <laughs> <laughs> right, so she was appointed chair, uh, uh, and here's the crazy thing: Julie Bushman, the new compensation committee chair, has a thir- has a 37 year career at 3M. Right, she retired as executive vice president. CEO Charles Cometh had a 24 year career at 3M. So that's who hey! they replaced her with. Yeah, that's yeah. Th- this is why networking. That's called impartial. Is so important, right? I mean, this is why women have so little influence because they just don't have enough friends, I guess. But yeah, that's what's going on there at Biotechni. I, just, you know, I can't get over the names. They all sound like they walked out of the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. Like it, at like Randolph C. Steer. Does, it doesn't. It, it sounds like a, like a comic villain in some way. And if you and, like, yeah, and if you like that level of pithy analysis, please. I, I want you to stay tuned to our the show that we will be announcing soon, the Proxy Show, where we'll be doing stories yeah, we just like it. this every week. Honestly, if you got a name suggestion, we're all ears. Um, we we gotta we gotta name the show. But I I, I how about better than to... Glass Lewis? Is that a, can we call it? That? <laughs> I think that's available actually as yeah. an iPod a podcast name. I I do want to point out that Randolph Steer still got more votes by more than double than the actual pay, right? Like he got 82% of investor (laughs) votes. Believe me, I don't understand. I don't understand what investors are up to. 82%. What do you have to do to to get like voted out? Knowing all of these are advisory votes. I know we're afraid to piss anybody off, but they're still all like steer could stay on the board and choose to ignore it. Right? Like it's it's basically an advisory vote. Shareholders that you know the the your company's share price was at one hundred and thirty dollars in twenty at the end of twenty twenty one. It's currently at fifty three dollars, right? It, it continues to fall at a very at a very steady and gradual rate. This guy has been on the board since nineteen ninety. You're pissed off <laughs> at, at his main function. And you still, still, you can't vote him out. You still need him around. You still I, can't. I, I, you just can't, can't pull that lever. Randolph it's, Steer. I can't. What, what happens if Because you don't want to offend him, right? You don't want to offend him. You know, if I get rid of Randolph Steer, how, how comes will off anybody hostile, be able to pay this guy? This is, yeah. this is really uh, All right, amazing. Let me, let me wrap up my segment. This show is going to be 16 hours long. Finally, a quiz here for you, Matt. A little quick quiz. Okay? Ooh, I, li- I love a quick quiz. And uh, uh, Here's the headline. Delta's chief sustainability officer is on a mission to use less fuel. Quick quiz. Is Delta's chief sustainability officer a man or a woman? Oh, wow. Um, uh, Surprise it's taking you this long to get to make this guess. Well, look, there's an obvious answer. Oh, you and think then I'm it's trying Delta, to trick you. Right? Yeah. Like there's like because it's yeah. Delta, oh, you have to doing. say like okay. you, you know, like this is a highly interconnected company. Foot like this is I'll give you a hint. Don't go too deep. <laughs> I'm gonna go with woman. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Because has there ever been <laughs> A chief sustainability officer is a man. Has there ever been a head no. of human resources that's a man? No, that's not I, true. That's not ta- true. Yeah, and there and, are chief yeah. sustainability officers, but they and they are men. They tend to be a men of color. Okay, and they tend to that, be in places that like was Chick-fil-A. my yeah, absolutely right. That was going to be my next point. But but you know what? Chief sustainability officer and chief uh, human resources officer have in common, Matt. They are both not in the pipeline to take over as CEO at publicly <laughs> traded corporations. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. There it is. Which brings us to... Finally. I've been waiting. I've been waiting all show for you, Matt. 
I mean, yeah, I haven't participated Come very on. much so far. All right, I got um, two things. One's quick and one's a bit longer. First, I want to do some quick. This is another tease of the show coming up. Um, yes, uh, this proxy is a show. Quick, quick director appointment roundup. Okay. E um, e I S S P N. Oh God, that your your acronyms are amazing. <laughs> Please, someone help Damien name the show. Um, this week, in the past seven days, we saw some new directors get added, and when I say added, I mean appointed because they don't get voted in and then added. They get appointed, and then you vote on them whenever the AGM is. So these are directors who have been appointed by the boards to the boards, and you'll get to vote on them later. First up is Root Inc. appointed Donna Dorsey. She's a black okay. woman. A uh -huh. she's diverse uh, human capital experience they touted this all over the place right. and the reason why i i'm i'm mentioning her is because it doesn't matter adam oh. tim the founder and ceo has 80 percent of the influence on the board and dual class oh. shares so oh. no one cares so, so cheating this is, is all, yeah don't cheat adam this is Adam Tim being like, I'm going to pick you for my board and then you are going to do what I say. So at good for point, Adam Matt, for getting that one. At this point, Matt, like I, I'm almost okay. If you're going to be founder and CEO and control the company, I'm almost okay if you're at least doing it with a one share, one vote. Like, Yeah, you know, do it that process. way. Yeah. Like if you yeah. actually just own a majority of the shares, I guess fine, you win. But come on. But Dude, it's cheating cheat. shares. Don't cheat. It's cheat shares. Um, which brings us to SEI Investments, who appointed Stephanie Miller to the board. She has a 25-year track record in asset management, including liquidity, administration, uh, multi-asset classes. And it doesn't matter because Alfred oh. West Jr. is the executive chair and founder. He has 83% of the influence on the board and no one cares. It's another, it doesn't matter, founder picked board. So congratulations to Stephanie for getting to green light everything Alfred says. Next up, we got Altus Power. Altus Power I just feel a, appointed. I feel a trend. I smell a trend. <laughs> even though, I'm, I, even though I've, I've been stopped up, I've been a head cold since last Tuesday, I, I smell a trend. I think you're on to something because yeah. Tina Chan Reich just joined their board at Altus. She's adding, uh -huh. um, she's actually being added directly to the nominating and audit committees. How often you don't see very often a new board member immediately joining committees. They mm -hmm. usually like onboard them for a little while and then slowly bring them on. But Tina comes from Amex. She's got 25 year track record on risk management. Oh, that sounds important. Except that Lars Norrell and Greg Felton, the co-founders, own collectively 78% of the influence. So no yeah. one cares. The co-founders yeah, own it all. Why do you need risk management no when it's just like a couple of dudes making it's decisions? two dudes deciding what happens. Yeah. Which brings us to our good news of the a week. Oh. There are companies that aren't basically controlled by their founders who do add board members like this company, Entain PLC. Mm -hmm. They're a UK-based um, entertainment gambling company. So if you're not into the gambling thing, then too bad. But they at, appointed Amanda Brown to the board, and they added her immediately to the compensation committee. That's not the audit committee, right? That's not the one where no one wants to listen to you because you're saying like, oh, that decimal place is off. This is the one mm -hmm. where it's like the CEO gets paid by you. Yeah. That's a powerful position. That's, that's, oh, yeah. you know, that's, that's got some and as real we know, heft to it. And as we know, a hundred percent of competition companies give the CEOs what they want. So that's, that's a good way to make friendship, a friendship that's with right. CEO. It's, yeah. it's good for, it's, it's friends. Yeah. It's, that's what you're Instant joining friends. the board for. Instant More friends. friends. <laughs> um, but here's why this one matters because yeah. Entain is a socialist board, according oh. to free flow analytics, socialist yeah. boards are where all the committees and the directors have roughly equal influence. You know, that sounds like it sounds like a board from uh, either the Europe or the UK. That's what that's my guess. It is a UK company. That's correct. Go, there you go. There you go. And it's one of the few companies with actually a massive positive female power gap. What? Plus, plus eighteen percent female wow. power gap cool. and they just added another woman to the board nice. and put her on the comp committee she is currently according to our data unconnected to the other board members in any obvious way we'll know more later but honestly mm -hmm. I love this i love this this is great this is yeah. a, this is what i call a good appointment a Impressive. solid appointment um which brings me to the next segment which is less solid because you sent me this story a new study from On Deck looked yes. at which firms' ex-employees become CEOs more often. 
They used LinkedIn data for um, Fortune 500 companies, and they have no time frame on this, but I, I assume these are current CEOs, and they looked at all the CEOs on LinkedIn and checked their prior experience, and they wanted to see which firms they had in common. So here is okay. your download. Ready? Mm -hmm. First of all, McKinsey is the number one prior no experience firm. 7% of current CEOs on the Fortune 500 wow. had worked at McKinsey at some point. 7.1%. Yeah. That's a lot. Wow. It is a lot. Bain was 6.7%. Wait, BC, yeah. <laughs> BCG at Bain. six and Kearney. Yeah. The, and the, 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 vulture, the vulture circling uh, Bain, yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, I'm not sure that BCG, Kearney, and Oliver Wyman, which round out the top five, notice that all of them are consulting firms. Every all, single one of the top all five. Private, all private? All private? All private, all okay. consulting. Um, Bain might be publicly traded, but okay, I, okay. I, 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 I'm pretty sure that like all of them are management consulting firms. And then we get into some more fun firms, including, and if you ever wonder why we talk about this all the time on this show, the NFL, the Wait, National what? Football League, yeah. the American Football League Wait, supplied 4.8% of current CEOs. Well, I don't know what that means. What do you mean? It means 4.8% of current Fortune 500 CEOs had work prior work experience what? inside the NFL. Stop. That is correct. Nope. That's, that's what they incredible. found. I mean, I, that's incredible. That's, well, good. It's now incredible. I'm, I'm all the more happy to, to crap on the NFL. Wow. Rounding that's that's the, amazing. Yeah. Rounding and, and I'm the guessing, top here. And I'm guessing yeah. from all the stories that we've covered on the NFL, those were not people of color. Those were white. No, no no, yeah. no, 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 no. Come on. Yeah, oh, I'm on. just saying. What, what kind of yeah. show are you running? The NFL, the, notoriously, like the over 70% of the NFL players are black, but basically none of the owners and none of the head coaches. No. Just saying, no, no, no. just saying. I mean, um, the rounding out the top here are Lazard, yeah. EMI, Goldman, P&G. In fact, 51.3% of current, okay. yeah, uh, Procter & Gamble, 51.3% of current Fortune 500 CEOs come from these 10 firms. Wow. That's important. It's important information to know. I'm glad they did this study. Yeah. For and once, here's I'm why glad I about thought, something. Here's why I thought it was important because um, if we're talking about 10 firms applying 50% of Fortune 500 CEOs, that sounds like a massive amount of groupthink. Like mm -hmm. ten, like the cultures of 10 firms I mean, are controlling off the charts, half off the charts, yeah. of the CEOs at, at the Fortune 500. So I want to add to your desperate fear of groupthink using yeah. free flow analytics data. This is data supplied to us by free flow analytics. Do you need any more of a, of a reason to buy our data? I mean, we've had so many no, wonderful of uh, sprinklings of delicious free flow data in this show today. So here's what I looked at. Um, I looked at the 450 lar US, largest U.S. companies, basically mirroring roughly the Fortune 500. And at 62% of them, or 282 companies, I, I found directors on the board who at least two of them went to the same exact school. Okay. We have data on um, undergrad, grad, you know, mm -hmm. uh, PhD, like all the schools that they went to. Um, there are 3,100 directors at these 282 companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and here are the most incestuous school director combinations at those companies. 282 yeah. companies. This is the schools most represented where they have multiple directors on the board that went to those schools. And I'm sure none of this will be a surprise, but go ahead. Yeah. We want to guess the first one. Harvard. Yes, it oh, is Harvard say Stanford Business. Or, or Stanford, but Harvard. Harvard, Harvard Business yeah. School. Right, of course. Specifically oh, MBA. A, a, MBA, yeah, 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 everyone okay. getting a Harvard Business School degree. Sure. 132 directors. 4.2% of the 3,100 directors went to Harvard Business School okay. and they're on boards together, right? right. Like these are boards with multiple of going Makes to the sense. same school. Yep. Stanford, 66 right, directors. Yep. They're next. Mm -hmm. Penn, 66 directors. Harvard again, but oh. this is undergrad. Harvard undergrad. Oh, so, that's, so that's roughly 6% represent just Harvard in general, right? Exactly. And, and then Cal at 48 and Wharton, which is also Penn. So uh -huh. 100 directors are Wharton and Harvard is what yeah. we're really looking at. What's wrong with we're you, Princeton? At, what's, what's going uh, on over here at Princeton? Why, why are you failing? 
Yeah, Princeton, yeah. Yale. What's wrong with you, not, Yale? Not even, you. not even in the running. And what about honestly, the University of Southern Maine? Uh, how, where are they on the list? Um, they, um, they, uh, they ranked. <laughs> yeah, they're somewhere. I, I yeah. think. Um, uh, like, I'm really sad for Brown, which is my alma mater. I thought be. I was getting a Something good education. About, yeah. I went to the Ivy League that no one likes and no one cares yeah. about. Apparently, well, um, let's let's, but, let's be real. The Ivy League is Harvard. Let's be fa- let's be fair. <laughs> apparently, but yeah. here is I went after going all, through all this data i wanted to pick your groupthink company of the week are you ready i don't don't know what that means but i'm so excited yeah your groupthink company of the week is ibm oh here here's why international business machines martha pollock fred wardell and fred mcnab all directors at ibm two friends they they all went to dartmouth okay i'm liking this yeah in fact mcnab and pollock both went to Dartmouth and got their undergrad degrees there, and they're two years apart in age, which Ooh. means they went there at the same exact time. They were Ooh. actually same parties, same same, dan- yeah. same parties. They go to the same reunion years. Yep, of course, Pollock, McNabb, and Gorski all went to Wharton too. So Wait, now we've got yeah. two okay. sets of directors yeah. that went to the same schools. So Pollock and McNabb, they they started at Dartmouth, and then they then they also went to Wharton. And then they also they, went to Wharton. Are they like married? Are they conjoined no, twins? Not, What's not the deal there? The, no? Not according okay. to the data, but the data does say that fully seventy five percent of the board is also connected through other boards. Meaning, not only did they all go to the same schools, seventy five percent of them actually have friends in common on other boards that they've sat wow. on. Wow. And that doesn't include Martha Pollock, who we who hasn't been on other boards and we can't connect to anybody. So yeah. now we are able to say more than 75% of the board is basically fully connected. Wow. In fact, the chair of the governance committee, Andy Liveris, who mm-hmm. uh, is all over the place, he knows 31% of the current board, 94% okay. of the board have been CEOs before, 91% of, of the yeah. board influence is held by directors connected to each other. And they all perform, according to Free Flow Analytics performance metrics, totally average. Well, they are 50% rotation players. Better than below batting. average. Better than below yeah, average. The, but basically what you're getting is pure average from a group of people who all know each other. What and you're basically IBM, getting is what you're basically getting is a big lump of Play-Doh and no one has, has decided to like separate the Play-Doh and make different toys right yeah. it's just one lump of play-doh i love <laughs> is, that what, is that is that what you're trying I to love say an analogy that compares a board <laughs> to play-doh i think that doesn't happen nearly yeah. enough um ibm does claim that its board is 25 percent diverse and 15 percent gender diverse which is pitiful to 15%, begin with 15 percent 15 percent 15 percent gender in 2023 are you reading a proxy from 1992 no this is this is today and but we could argue that they are wow. actually zero percent diverse everyone on that board yeah. basically went to the same school knows each other's friends you know hangs out on boards if they don't go to the met gala wow. together they're at the reunions together that's pretty much the way this works not to belabor a 17-hour segment but What's point? What sticks out to me is that I wonder if there are other fifteen percent in the S and P five hundred is is absurdly low, right? I yeah, mean, you don't even really, see that really, anymore. Really yeah. I wonder if other boards of this nature with such ridiculously low uh, amount of women on the boards also suffer from some of the same groupthink nonsense, right? Because I mean, that again, fifteen percent. I mean, it's nineteen eighty seven talking. I may, I may have stuck. Well, I mean, IBM is basically stuck in 1987 in some ways. IBM, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, but I do want to congratulate them. This is, this is a victory that's hard to achieve. It's really hard in in 2023 to stack the board this completely with people who all went to the same schools, who all work mm-hmm. on the same boards, and yeah. there is basically no diversity. That's congratulations, hard. IBM. Good I mean, they, you have to work at that. All right, yeah. before we get out of here, Paul has been waiting outside. I actually left him out. It's cold. It's cold. It's, it's cold. cold here. Let him inside. I know no, you can, no, he can no, stand dude. behind you. No, no, I'm not. I don't like people hovering over it's me. Weird. So I it's made him weird. wait outside. Um, and Paul's a heavy here's Paul. Too. Here's Paul talking about some uh, deep ESG uh, metrics. Paul, come in. 
Hello, Paul Hodgson here with S-Gage Statistic of the Week. I just got in my inbox an email from Agenda Week, a publication of the Financial Times, indicating that some boards may be re-examining their use of ESG metrics and incentive plans in the face of criticism from certain investors who say companies are using the qualitative goals to paper over issues with financial performance. Now, I can't comment on that, but it wouldn't be the first time that companies use soft targets to excuse poor performance against hard targets. But what I can do is tell you how many of the S&P 500 and the Russell 3000 actually uses ESG metrics in their incentive plans. So what we're looking at um, for the whole Russell 3000 are 1,665 standalone ESG metrics uh, for all executives, 2,627 ESG metrics included in business strategy scorecards, and 1,988 ESG metrics included in individual performance assessments for executives. So that's quite a lot of people covered by ESG metrics. Now, some of those executives ha might have two or three ESG metrics assigned to them, either in individual performance metrics or as a standalone metric. But just looking at the kind of overall statistics for the use of ESG performance metrics, um, in the Russell 3000, there is something like 55%. So just over half of companies have no ESG metrics in their incentive plan. So it's not as widespread in the Russell 3000 as it is in the S&P 500, where less than a quarter have no ESG metrics in their incentive plan. So it's 24.3%. So more than three quarters of companies in the S&P 500 have in adopted ESG metrics in their incentive plans. Uh, the majority of those are using them in um, individual performance assessments. So, for example, if an executive has a, a whole list of uh, performance targets assigned to them individually, there will be an ESG metric or one or more ESG metrics within that individual performance assessment. Um, the next most common, 35.2%, uh, um, are being used in a strategic scorecard, so a business strategy scorecard. So again, these could be for individual executives or they could be for the executive team as a whole. There's a whole list of uh, financial targets and other types of targets in there as well that could be ESG related or could be strategically um, significant for the company. And then uh, the smallest number, the smallest percentage rather at 31.4% is for individual standalone metrics. So that's, so for example, for the whole executive team, you might have um, a return on capital metric, a uh, profitability metric, and then for the whole executive team, a single standalone ESG metric, one or more single standalone ESG metrics, which could have something to do with you know, GHG, uh, emission reduction targets. It could have something to do with the diversity, equity, and inclusion targets. So the most common um, ESG metrics are carbon footprint and emission reductions, uh, diversity and inclusion, employee health and safety, customer satisfaction, and cybersecurity. The other thing that can be seen over time, just looking at the S&P 500, is that there has been a fairly significant growth over the years that we've been looking at it at S-Gage since 2021. Fairly significant growth in the use of such metrics. So, so just to look at the kind of negative aspect of it, so it's gone down from um, just over a third in 2021 with no ESG metrics, now to just under a quarter. Um, most of the growth in that has been in the use of ESG metrics in strategic scorecards, so business strategy scorecards, um, and in standalone metrics. Um, as part of individual performance assessment, the numbers have dropped slightly there um, in that particular usage, but overall grown over time. So this is Paul Hodgson with the S-Gage Statistic of the Week, signing off. Paul. I have a request for you. That's a lot of statistics about how much ESG metrics are in pay, but nothing about how much pay they get for the ESG metrics. Because the answer to that question is almost none. Isn't it like a pointless number? Yes. Paul, answer my question. Paul, help me. Here that is Paul. That's Paul Hodgson from SKH. He's really pissed because I left him outside for so long. So he left immediately. I am your analyst, Hall Matt Muscardi. That was Damian Rawls. We are free float. Go get S gauge data, but only after you get free float analytics data. And look out for our new show. 
We're actually going to record our first episode next week. We're going to drop it soon thereafter. We don't know what it's going to be called. You got a name suggestion? Hit us on LinkedIn. Hit us on social. Send us the a direct email. Show. The proxy show is horrible. It's really, so crazy. It's probably going to end up being that. It's horrible. <laughs> um, it's like my my brother named his uh, stuffed elephant when he was a kid. Elephanty. That's basically proxy what you pants. just did. <laughs> proxy pants. That's it. We'll be back on Friday to wrap the week. Until then, goodbye.